Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of thy Son, grant that as his death, that as by his death he hath recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever.
The Lord be with you. It's a continuation of the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do what I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go out and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. May my words be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Acts of the Apostles, from which we heard today's first reading, is essentially a history book. It was written in the first century AD, probably in the second half of it, and it was written in an age when the orderly account of history was prized Herodotus, in the Greek-speaking world, had set the gold standard in the 5th century BC. The Hebrew scriptures, the Bible, of course, of the early church, had a whole sequence of history books which long predate Herodotus. These books, too, set in order a range of sources, some folkloric and others clearly from contemporary annals. One of the things to watch out for with the writing of history is that it is rare that those writing it come without a strong reason for why they are doing so. 
Very interestingly, I think, as well as all these past historians with their careful, if possibly loaded, histories, at the time of the New Testament's composition, and independent of it, a Jewish soldier was in Rome in the early 70s AD. By then, Flavius Josephus, a veteran of the Jewish war which had raged from 66 to 73 AD, and in his mid-30s, under the patronage of the victorious Emperor Vespasian, was commanded to write the history of the conflict, and alongside that, a history of his own people. We cannot be sure exactly when the Acts of the Apostles was written, but it's a safe bet that it was roughly contemporary with what Josephus was writing. Whether the author of Acts knew Josephus' work, sadly, we shall never know, but chronicling in an age when history was being recorded in a self-consciously orderly way must have informed the historically-minded author of the Acts of the Apostles. Who was this person? It's not a mystery, or at least we have an awful lot of clues. Acts is a second volume, the first, of course, being the Gospel of Luke. The two books together make up just over a quarter of the New Testament, so a very important corpus of literature within the New Testament. For many, Luke's is the best gospel. It has sublime poetry, the Magnificat and the Nunc Dimittis, the most memorable nativity stories, the angels and the shepherd's fields and the inn at Bethlehem, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the story at the crucifixion of the penitent thief, not forgetting the resurrection story of the road to Emmaus. Irenaeus, writing in the late second century, tells us the writer was St. Luke, the companion of St. Paul and a physician. It is clear from how both books are introduced, they are by the same person, not an eyewitness, but one who sought to use their sources wisely in the writing down of their history. The introduction to the Gospel underlines, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely from time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. So, St. Luke's method was from the start to be accurate, truthful, and orderly. Just as Josephus had a record, has a record, just as Josephus has as a record, sorry, just as Josephus needs to set a record straight in the writing of his Jewish war, so Luke is writing in apologetic terms too. Luke and Josephus were both apologists, not people saying sorry, but giving explanations. Josephus is trying to explain how and why the Jews almost fatally turned on the Roman Empire. Luke is trying to explain why what had been reserved for Israel was now being given into others' hands. At the end of the Acts of the Apostles, which we don't often hear read on Sundays, Paul arrives in the early 60s AD in Rome, awaiting his final trial. The leaders of Rome's Jewish community come to hear him. He spent a day, Luke tells us, from morning until evening, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets. They disagreed among themselves and departed. Paul made one statement. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. The Jews, in fact, have left when Paul makes this statement. I think Paul is addressing us, rather assuming we are Gentiles. What had been the preserve of his nation is now extended to all. This is precisely the message that Paul has always preached and his epistle to the Romans of ten years earlier has this as its central theme as well. Luke's task in Acts is to tell the story of the early church. Paul is perhaps Luke's greatest hero and far more than half of the account of the book is 
Paul's ceaseless work of preaching around the Mediterranean. But the early part of the book focuses on St. Peter. Today's first reading, which we hear the end of the account of, is prefaced with Cornelius's vision in Caesarea. So Cornelius has a vision that uh, all foods are clean and edible for those who would follow Jesus. Peter has a corresponding vision. He's in Joppa at the time, further down the coast, which leads to Peter accepting an invitation from Cornelius's messengers and travelling back with them to Caesarea. An account offered by Cornelius of why he has asked Peter to come is next, followed by Peter's retelling of the story of Jesus' life, death and resurrection and promise of forgiveness. At this point, the reading that we had today picks up the story. As the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and Cornelius and his household are baptised. In this story, Peter, stalwart pillar of the Jerusalem church, is suddenly confronted with a truth he could barely imagine, that his Lord was blessing not only foods Peter could never eat, but is inviting Peter to see that the gospel might move beyond the bounds of his nation. From this distance, it is hard to sense what a big deal this revelation to Peter was and what a huge impact this will have within the early church and the, for the church's future. The baton will soon, will soon pass in the narrative from Peter to Paul, as Paul becomes the focus of it. Paul, a zealous, zealous Pharisee turned preacher, ventures way beyond the coastline of Palestine. He takes the gospel to the most unexpected places and people. But Peter led the way in his visit to Cornelius, the Roman centurion. Paul now follows and will overtake. The implications of this will threaten goodwill within the emerging church. James, the brother of the Lord, and Peter in Jerusalem will become associated with antagonism to what Paul was doing. And there is just the chance that Paul's later arrest in the book of Acts in Jerusalem may even have been part of a deliberate plot to stifle his mission and show the depths of the division within the early church. Luke, our historian, rather papers over some of the cracks. One commentator says obliquely that Luke knows more than he is prepared to tell us about the divisions within the early church. His historical method is perhaps partial and selective. But in the Acts of the Apostles, we find one of the most thrilling narratives of the loving purposes of God. It is addressed to each one of us personally. It reminds us of the great privilege of our Christian vocation. Before Jesus ascends into heaven, which of course we'll be celebrating on Thursday, Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. St. Luke is asking us, how will we be a part of this task? Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures 
and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this Rogation Sunday, we we pray for the crops and all who work upon the land. O Lord, who alone givest seed to the sower and bread to the eater, and hast taught us to seek from thee our daily bread, bless the sowing of the seed, and grant fertility to the soil that receives it, that in due time there may be a bountiful harvest. Lord, in thy mercy, let the earth be fruitful and its resources be hallowed. Look with favour upon all who care for the earth, the water and the air, The riches of thy creation may abound from age to age. Lord, in thy mercy. May it please thee to grant favourable weather, temperate rain and fruitful seasons, that there, there may be food and drink for all thy creatures. Lord, in thy mercy. Send thy blessing upon all who work upon the land and water. May they find dignity and just reward in their labours. We beseech thee to bring freedom to any who are enslaved, exploited, and oppressed. Lord, in thy mercy. We pray for the sick and the suffering, and ask thy blessing upon them. We remember June Newton, Helen Spinks, Margaret Salter, Beatrice Mayhew, Maurizio Barbier, Jane Mary Green, Anzi Chu Kang, Joe Fisher, Michael Branwell, Judy Burgess, Denise Marshall, Margaret Cooper, Alan Hall, Amy Fagan, Hilary Coote, Jessica Redfern, Martin Miller, Caroline Bennett, Mary Wilson, and Richard McLaren. Lord, in thy mercy. We commend to thy gracious keeping, O Lord, the souls of the faithful departed, remembering those who have died recently and those whose anniversaries occur at this time. Amongst them, Harry Lyle, Ian Brook, Wendelson Asrate, and Jean-Claude Madrange. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. We offer these prayers in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Mark, and all thy saints. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbours, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God, meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word and deed, against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honour and glory of thy name through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen Mighty God our Heavenly Father who of his great mercy have promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him 
Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand for the peace? The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thee thanks, almighty and eternal Father. And in this Eastertide, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of thy wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, thy risen Son, hath conquered the powers of death and hell, and restored in men and women the image of thy glory. He hath placed them once more in paradise, and hath opened to them the gate of life eternal. And so, in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of thy glory. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of thy Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine may be unto us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks to thee he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to thee, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, 
we look for the coming of his kingdom, and with this bread and this cup we make the memorial of Christ thy Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Except through him, our great High Priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of thy divine majesty, renew us by thy Holy Spirit, inspire us with thy love, and unite us in the body of thy Son, Jesus Christ, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. As our Saviour Christ hath commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share. Alleluia, Christ our sacrifice, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be pleased.
Let us pray. O God, our Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, doth give the water of eternal life, may we thirst for thee, the spring of life and fountain of goodness, through him who liveth and reigneth now and for ever. Amen. Very warm welcome to any visitors. Please do stay and come and have some coffee at our coffee stall just outside the church afterwards. I'm sorry we can't serve it in church, but at the moment restrictions uh, are such that we can't. But hopefully it won't be long before things like that may may lift and we may even be, even be able to sing again as a congregation in church. Um, there was a lovely verse in, in one of our hymns earlier. Um, for the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, pleasures pure and undefiled. We've had several members of our serving team, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, but today is, I think, the first grandmother-granddaughter combination. So uh, lovely to have uh, Cecilia back at the altar after over a year, and Renee, who's recently confirmed serving today. Uh, Marvellous to have you. And before we give them a clap, a clap to be included for Denise, who's back with us after a little spell in hospital. So could we give all three a welcome back? Thursday is Ascension Day, and we're resuming our practice of joining up with St. Mary's Primrose Hill. It's our turn to go there. Sadly, for Palm Sunday, they weren't able to come here because of the restrictions on numbers, but we may now go to them on uh, Ascension Day. So three-line whip for us all to be there on Thursday evening at 8 o'clock. Their evening services are at 8, unlike our usual service times, but uh, it gives us time to get ready and be there in good time. Sadly, our choirs and servers can't join up yet. That hopefully will be next year, but our congregations can. So please let us be there in good numbers on Thursday at 8 o'clock to celebrate the Ascension. Uh, I think I'm preaching there. It's one of those feasts I get a little muddled about, so I hope I've reached a conclusion by the time we get there. We'll see if I will. Would you please stand for the blessing? The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.